I'll begin with a couple of queries about what we covered in the last lecture. Specifically, why does a eutectic reaction proceed rapidly, often being completed over a very narrow temperature range? And in contrast, why does the growth rate of a pro phase decrease as the particle grows? This illustrates a eutectic mixture in a binary alloy where one of the phases is depleted in solute and the other one is enriched in solute. However, the average chemical composition of this eutectic mixture is the same as that of the liquid. So the composition of the liquid doesn't actually change as transformation proceeds and that allows the reaction to proceed rapidly because the far field composition is not changing. Any solute that is partitioned into the liquid, uh, for example here, would be absorbed by the phase which likes to have that solute. So the diffusion fields are actually very narrow. Consider the growth of a pro eutectic phase alpha from liquid of composition C bar. Now obviously at any temperature the alpha has a smaller solubility for solute when it's in contact with the liquid than the liquid has for the solute when it's in contact with alpha. Therefore, as the alpha grows, solute will be partitioned into the liquid uh, and the concentration profile that we expect at the interface between the alpha and the liquid here is as follows where this is the solubility of solute in alpha in contact with liquid, this point here, and this is the solubility of solute in liquid which is in contact with alpha. So obviously since the solid is depleted in solute, uh, it will partition the excess solute into the liquid. So this area here, which is the solute which is partitioned into the liquid, must be equal to this area uh, under this concentration profile. So as the alpha grows, the liquid will accumulate more and more solute in front of the transformation interface, which is here. And as a consequence, when the alpha becomes thicker, the concentration gradient in the liquid in the liquid decreases. So here, for example, it's quite sharp. Here it is much more gentle. So the solute has to diffuse over longer distances so that we don't exceed the concentration here, which is Cl alpha. Therefore, the growth rate slows down as the particle becomes thicker. And this is the form of the size of the particle as a function of time. So initially it thickens quite rapidly and then this gradient becomes more and more gentle as time proceeds. So this slowing down is entirely because the average composition of the liquid is changing as the alpha forms and solute is partitioned into the liquid to a greater and greater extent as the alpha becomes bigger. And this is why this is not at all like the eutectic reaction where the average composition of the liquid does not change. So today's lecture is about diffusion and I've illustrated this by taking a jar of water and very gently putting some blue ink into the jar and over time you can see that the ink spreads out until eventually we will get a homogeneous solution with a uniform blue color. So diffusion is often defined as the action of spreading. You can see the spreading here. Uh, now, this is a loose definition because you'll see in the lecture that follows that sometimes we can get unspreading. In other words, if I start off with a completely blue solution here, it will tend to develop into regions which are dark blue and light blue that's unspreading. But that's another story for the next lecture. Now before I go on to diffusion, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of related phenomena 
which have been discovered over centuries. So for example, this is a paper by uh, Joseph Fourier. So, um, he came up with this law that the flux of heat is equal to the thermal conductivity times a temperature gradient. So this is temperature and this distance. And there's a minus sign here because heat diffuses down a gradient of temperature. In other words, the gradient itself is negative, And therefore, when I multiply by k, I get a negative quantity. And then the minus sign makes it positive so that the heat flux is down the, const, uh, down the temperature gradient. And that was back in 1822. And this is known as uh, Fourier's law relating heat flux to the temperature gradient and this is the thermal conductivity. Now notice the linear relationship here between the flux and if you like the force which is the temperature gradient which drives the flow of heat. Now similarly um, Ohm came up with Ohm's law where the electrical current is proportional to the voltage which effectively is the force and the proportionality is one upon the electrical resistance here and that was shortly after Fourier in 1827. So once again we have a linear relationship between a flux which in this case is an electrical current and whatever is driving the current the force if you like and that is the voltage here related by a proportionality constant which is 1 upon the electrical resistance. So 1822 and 1827 and this now in 1855 Adolf Fick who was working in the Department of Anatomy at Zurich uh, came up with a law describing diffusion. And he was uh, studying the transfer of salt between uh, a salt-rich solution and a salt-poor solution and concluded that if you keep everything else constant, ceteris paribus means you keep everything else constant, then the flux of salt will be directly proportional to the difference in concentration and inversely proportional to the distance between the diffusing uh, regions. So the flux of matter in this case is written as being proportional to the gradient of concentration. So this is concentration and this is the distance and we have the diffusion coefficient here which is the proportionality constant between the flux and whatever is driving the flux. Uh, in this case dc by dz. So once again we have a minus sign here because the flux is going along the concentration gradient which is in fact negative. So this term here is negative, concentration is increasing, distance is increasing and therefore the gradient here is negative. And therefore we have a minus sign here so that the total product here becomes a positive flux along the z direction. So very similar then to the heat flux equation by Fourier and the electrical resistance equation by Ohm. And it's not really surprising because, you know, Fourier himself says in his paper that, uh, you know, this law for diffusion of salt in its solvent must be identical uh, to, for example, the diffusion of heat in a conducting body, as Fourier had uh, found. And also Ohm had applied it to the diffusion, if you like, of electricity in a conductor. So these three laws, which came over a period of about uh, 40 years, all have the similarity that the flux is directly proportional to something which drives the flux, and then there is a proportionality constant. In the case of diffusion, we call it the diffusion coefficient. So some of you might be aware of Brownian motion. Uh, if you observe particles of pollen in a liquid, then you will see that each particle uh, undergoes uh, 
fairly haphazard and random movements uh, and those uh, Einstein showed are due to collisions with uh, atoms which are moving due to thermal vibrations and from that he was able to calculate uh, the uh, size of an atom or, or the mass of an atom. Now that's fairly random motion so how does that differ from diffusion? Well, uh, diffusion actually happens along certain directions uh, driven, for example, by a concentration gradient along a particular direction uh, and so on. So there is a difference between Brownian motion and diffusion and we'll develop that difference shortly. But first I want to show you uh, a movie um, of Brownian motion. So this is a movie recorded by Harukazu Yoshino from Osaka Metropolitan University and I've taken a small excerpt from that movie and you can see these particles moving by Brownian motion fairly haphazard and random movements. Uh, now obviously we are not getting a flux in a particular direction uh, but we nevertheless have movements of particles. Now it would be interesting to work out the root mean square distance traveled by each particle and I'll explain why we need to think about root mean square uh, distance rather than just distance shortly. Consider now uh, random jumps along a straight line such that there are no correlations between successive steps. The, there is isotropy that means going in this direction is the same as going in this direction and each step is of unit length. Now because the jumps happen in random directions the average distance moved will be zero. Uh, just to illustrate that, uh, Z1 for example in four successive jumps it could be along plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one and the average of these will be zero. And similarly this jump Z2 can have plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one and on average uh, the distance moved will be zero. But of course uh, the square of Z1 uh, will give us four and similarly for Z2 will give four. And products like these Z1, Z2 uh, again they will sum on average to zero. So uh, supposing I work out a mean square distance moved uh, which will be the mean value of all of these jumps squared. Uh, then if you expand this term here yeah, you will get z1 squared plus z2, z2 squared and so on until zn squared and there will be terms like this. And of course these on average, these, uh, these bars over the terms indicate average values, these on average will be zero like so uh, and therefore we can write the mean square distance uh, since z1 and z2 are equal to 1, um, the mean square distance is equal to the number of jumps and therefore the root mean square distance, square root of this is square root of n. So the distance moved will be proportional to the square root of the number of jumps. Now let's call the root mean square distance as uh, z bar and uh, say the step length is not unit but is a value lambda and in interatomic spacing and that the frequency with which atoms attempt jumps is nu. Then z bar is equal to lambda times the square root of the number of jumps and the number of jumps is simply equal to the jump frequency times the time and therefore z bar will be proportional to the interatomic spacing multiplied by the square root of the jump frequency and the time. So it will vary like so uh, a parabolic curve here proportional to time to the half rather than as a straight line here proportional to time and you can take this as a rough distance uh, you would expect during diffusion over a period of time t. Now we noted earlier that a random walk has no stimulus other than thermal vibrations so there is no preferred direction. 
Diffusion, on the other hand, can be oriented because it tends to occur as some function of the gradients in concentration. So consider uh, the scenario here where we have a concentration gradient and these are atoms arranged on a lattice. And the concentration is defined as atoms per meter cubed. So if we consider a unit area uh, going normal to the plane of this diagram, then the concentration per unit area is simply C times the thickness of each plane, which is lambda. So that gives us the atoms per unit area, in other words, the concentration per meter squared. And diffusion will tend to occur along this gradient here. So Z is again our distance and C is the concentration. And the change in concentration, delta C, as we progress along here, it depends on how steep this concentration gradient is. Now, delta C is simply uh, equal to the distance lambda times the magnitude of the gradient dc by dz. And we can define a flux, that means the number of atoms jumping across this plane uh, per unit time as the number of atoms per meter squared of the area across which the jumps are happening uh, per unit of time. And we are considering a one-dimensional flux. That means uh, diffusion is happening just along one direction. Now the flux from the left-hand side to the right-hand side will be equal to 1 upon 6 times the uh, jump frequency times the concentration per unit area on this plane. And the 1 6 comes in because the jumps can happen in the forward, the reverse, upwards, downwards, into the plane of the diagram and out of the plane of the diagram. So that's like a coordination number. But you will also have jumps going from the right hand side to the left hand side. And because on this plane the concentration is different from this, we just add this term delta C, which is lambda into the magnitude of the gradient. Therefore, the net flux is equal to the difference between the flux from left to right and right to left, and that is simply minus 1, 6 nu delta C into lambda. And we can replace delta C by lambda into the concentration gradient, so we arrive at this equation here, where it's minus 1, 6 nu into lambda squared into dc by dz. And this then becomes what we call the diffusion coefficient. You know, it's a function of interatomic spacing and the jump frequency here, d. So this is, of course, Fix's law. And because the units of flux are atoms per meter squared per uh, second, um, and we are multiplying the diffusion coefficient by a concentration gradient, uh, then the units of a diffusion coefficient will be meter squared per second. Just to give you an example of the application of the law that we have just derived, and that's known as Fick's first law, that the flux is proportional to minus d times the gradient of concentration. Um, most drugs, uh, they go across biological membranes by what the biologists refer to as passive diffusion. That means diffusion satisfying Fick's first law. You know, there are other kinds of diffusion through a membrane. For example, the drug may be carried by a carrier across the membrane, or it may actually react with some of the fluids inside the membrane. But most drugs seem to follow the Fick's first law, where the rate of drug transfer is proportional to the difference in concentration. So supposing we have a concentration C1 here, this is our membrane with a thickness delta M, uh, typically uh, about 10 nanometers in thickness. And on the other side the, of the membrane, the concentration is C2. Then we clearly have a gradient here, and the flux of whatever we are putting on this side will depend on the magnitude of the gradient and the effective diffusion coefficient inside this membrane. Mm -hmm.
Notice that instead of just saying diffusion coefficient uh, for the membrane, I said the effective diffusion coefficient of the membrane because biological membranes are actually complex and they have a structure. And some, some amines are polar and they cannot dissolve in the membrane lipids and therefore they cannot penetrate. Okay? So, so it also depends on the species which is attempting to diffuse through the membrane. And drugs like diazepam and fentanyl, they dissolve in the uh, membrane fluids and therefore can diffuse very rapidly. And morphine, uh, which is often used uh, to suppress pain, is less soluble, so it diffuses slowly through cell membranes and therefore you get a delayed response. So Fix's first law is very useful in thinking about how drugs of various kinds uh, will go through cell membranes. Now, if the concentration difference across the membrane is fixed, then the flux through that membrane will also be constant. So if you take a, a thin membrane, like so, and we place it between a uh, uh, solution containing whatever we are trying to measure, for example, a morphine solution, and on the other side is a large container uh, into which the morphine diffuses, then the concentration doesn't change much in this container. And of course, this is also a constant concentration. So there's a, a constant gradient across the membrane, and we can measure the amount of flux going into this solution on, on this side. So here is a plot, for example, for ibuprofen going through cellulose nitrate. And we are plotting here milligrams per centimeter squared of the membrane of cellulose nitrate. Uh, nitrate. And this is the time. The gradient here represents the flux, you know, milligrams per centimeter squared per hour. And you can see that the uh, data are basically represented by a straight line. In other words, the flux through the membrane is constant, obeying Fix's first law. Now, obviously, when we have a constant concentration gradient, the flux at every value of Z is identical, and the concentration at any particular value of Z does not change, even though we have diffusion happening. Now, there are many scenarios where this gradient may not be constant. For example, if you are looking at diffusion through a thick membrane rather than a thin membrane. Uh, so, the concentration may vary non-linearly with distance. Now, what that means is that the flux here, where the gradient is large, will be greater than the flux here, where the gradient is gentle. And therefore, the concentration at any point becomes a function of time. And I'll give you some examples shortly. But first we'll derive Fix's second law, which deals with non-uniform concentration gradients. So consider this uh, non-uniform concentration gradient in this bar, which has a unit area here. Uh, and we'll look at two of these planes, which are separated by distance delta z. Then the flux uh, going into this uh, element between the planes 1 and 2 is the diffusion coefficients times the gradient that exists at the location 1 and the minus sign as usual because the gradient is negative. And the flux out of this uh, volume element is minus d into dc by dz where the gradient is defined at the position 2. And of course that gradient uh, can be calculated as the basically how the gradient changes with z times dz. In other words, this term here is the change in the gradient relative to plane 1. So, in the time interval delta t, the concentration changes inside that volume element by delta c into delta z, which is equal to the flux in by minus the flux out of uh, plane 2 times the time interval delta t. And if you think about it, you know, substitute for the fluxes, 
then the change in concentration at any point as a function of time is simply the diffusion coefficient times the way in which the gradient varies with the distance z. In other words, d squared c by dz squared. And this here is known as Fix's second law of diffusion, uh, which defines diffusion in a non-uniform concentration gradient and how the concentration at a particular point changes with time uh, is given by the diffusion coefficient times the way in which the gradient actually varies with the distance z. Now, this is a case where we have a thin plating of red material onto this bar which extends to infinity. In other, in other words, the far field concentration will not change as the red material diffuses into this semi-infinite bar. And the boundary conditions for solving this equation are that the total amount of solute at any point in time uh, must be equal to the amount that we plated on in this thin layer and that at time equals zero and distance equals zero the concentration inside the bar is also zero. So the solution of Fix's second law subject to these boundary conditions is an exponential solution like this where the concentration as a function of distance and time varies with the amount of solute that we plated on and the exponential of the square of the distance uh, in the semi-infinite bar. So at first the solute uh, is confined to the near regions of this interface and then it extends further as time progresses and the peak concentration also drops. Now you can verify that this actually is a solution of this simply by differentiating it and checking that this is what you obtain. Now in this diagram I've exaggerated the thickness of the plating, the red plating. It's actually a thin layer but supposing I wanted to actually connect a long red bar to a long white bar then the scenario would be somewhat different although still represented by Fix's second law of diffusion. So supposing now we have a long a bar of this material connected to a long bar of this material, both extending to infinity or minus infinity, uh, then if we provide an opportunity for diffusion to occur, then obviously there will be changes in concentration in both of the bars. Initially there was a step function here and that would change into a more gradual variation in concentration. Now earlier on we derived the exponential function when a thin layer of material was plated onto a semi-infinite bar. Well we can think about this grey bar as a whole load of thin layers plated onto this bar but located at different positions. And then it becomes easy to find the solution to fix the second law because we can regard all, each of these slices located at different positions as exponential functions and just integrate uh, taking into account the fact that the slices are located at different positions and therefore we would need to integrate this exponential function and the integral of all these functions all these exponential all these thin layers as a function of distance from node to z uh, gives us what is known as the error function. It's just a combi whole combination of a whole lot of exponential functions located at different positions and this is the representation of any one of these diffusion profiles. So CS is simply the average composition between CA and CB and C0 is either CB or CA depending on which side of the diffusion couple we are treating. And the error function, as I indicated, is the sum of all the exponential functions. So you can find tabulations of the error function uh, in many locations. So each of these diffusion profiles is represented by this function when we have a thick bar on another thick bar, a diffusion couple. 
Now I want to show you an example of the application of the error function solution of Fix's second law of diffusion. Uh, this is actually a car uh, which is solar powered and taking part in a race in Australia. This is Lucy Fielding who was my PhD student who participated in this event. And solar cells of course uh, um, have to store electricity in the form of uh, batteries inside the car and here is an illustration of one of these uh, lithium-ion batteries uh, not not in this car but in another device that I had which broke okay so obviously we have copper connectors uh, with this lithium-ion battery and what Copper is particularly useful in the sense that it doesn't actually form any intermetallic compounds with lithium. So this is the phase diagram for the copper-lithium system. And lithium has a large solubility uh, in copper, but copper almost does not dissolve in lithium. But there are no intermetallic compounds that copper and lithium form, which is good because the copper can continue to function as a, a conductor. Now the lithium and copper inside the battery are in contact uh, and lithium diffuses into the copper because it has a solubility inside the copper and this is a representation of, of uh, a measured lithium concentration profile inside the copper electrode and it follows the uh, error function that we derived earlier. Now from this you can actually work out the diffusion coefficient of lithium in copper. And by doing this, it was found that the lattice and grain boundary diffusion coefficients of lithium in copper are 13 orders of magnitude smaller than previously reported. So the previous measurements were done differently. These are very accurate measurements and they show a diffusion coefficient which is 13 orders of magnitude smaller than previously reported. Quite remarkable. Now, many of you will be familiar with seeing images like this, where at a construction site, there's an awful lot of steel bars, okay, and they are corrugated bars. Now, steel bars are needed to reinforce concrete because concrete is not very strong in tension. In compression it's extremely strong so what you do is you place the steel bars inside the concrete while it's solidifying and therefore the composite material is able to take both tensile and compressive loads uh, this is a, a building that was being constructed while I was in South Korea and it was a building for a new laboratory uh, in which I was going to work and my job was to create a computational metallurgy laboratory when the whole building is constructed. Uh, it was a graduate institute of ferrous technology. Now you can see here, for example, these steel bars poking out and they're all a part of the concrete which has been cast around them uh, to reinforce the concrete so that it can support both tensile and compressive stresses okay and build in a fairly short period of time so the entrance it looks like the, a glass blast furnace uh, used for making iron and this structure here is on, on a bigger picture it would look like the anvil that we use to hit pieces of iron and the building was opened in 2009 uh, really had a wonderful time over there working on computational metallurgy. Now whenever we use uh, steel reinforced concrete uh, there is a worry that if water penetrates the concrete that it will cause the corrosion of the metal bars, the iron bars and that in turn causes expansion and fracture of the concrete. And of course structures like these are in seawater and seawater is much more corrosive than uh, ordinary water. So it's an important problem to ensure that the reinforced uh, uh, concrete does not 
allow the penetration of water. Now, by doing calculations and measurements of the diffusion of chloride ions into concrete, you can estimate how far the seawater penetrates as a function of time and distance using the error function rule because we've got lots and lots of seawater outside and we have concrete so it's like two semi-infinite bars as far as uh, these distances are concerned. So by doing these measurements you can work out the diffusion coefficient under ambient conditions and therefore decide at what point you know the water actually the chloride ions actually penetrate to a sufficient depth to cause problems. Now are there any approximations in applying this equation to the penetration of chloride ions into concrete? Well concrete is not a homogeneous material it actually has a complex microstructure and perhaps some porosity as well. So what we are doing here is using an effective diffusion coefficient, rather like when we were talking about the biological membranes, uh, which also are not uh, homogeneous and have structure within them.